Hello and welcome to the uh, second ever Repro Action Act and Learn webinar. We're going to get started now. Um, our topic tonight is Sex, Lies, and Sting Videos, Making Sense of the Calls to Ban Abortion, Defund Planned Parenthood, and Shut Down the Government. Your hosts are Erin Matson, that's me. I'm from Arlington, Virginia. And our other host is Pamela Merritt, and I'll let Pamela introduce herself. Thanks, Erin. Uh, Pamela Merritt, and I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. Great, and we are Repro Action's co-founders and co-directors. All right, so we're here tonight because there is a whole lot going on, both um, in the states as well as at the federal level, with sting videos that have targeted Planned Parenthood and a number of different associated calls to defund Planned Parenthood and to maybe even shut down the government, as well as many other abortion bans that are being attached to this so-called controversy. Um, so let's get started with an, a quick agenda. So we're going to start by introducing ReproAction. We'll talk a little bit about responding in a positive way. How can we stand up for abortion fully even when we're on the defense? Um, we'll do a quick overview of what's going on, breaking down a number of the different threats um, that are happening both federally and at the state level. Then we're going to break into a panel discussion. We'll start with what's happening at the state level, and we're very excited that Representative State C. Newman um, from Missouri has joined us. Uh, the next one is what's happening at the federal level, and we'll be joined by Emily Crockett who's federal policy reporter for RH Reality Check. And then we'll also dive into which voices are being shut out of this discussion. And we're very excited to have Renee Bracey Sherman, a reproductive justice advocate, on with us for that portion of the Q&A. Uh, then we'll move into next steps, things that you can do moving forward to take action. And finally, we'll go with a Q&A with our panelists and or Repro Action co-directors. So that's a piece I want to... Uh, let you know that if you have questions for any of the panelists or uh, Pamela or myself, uh, feel free to put those in the chat box. We will be moderating, moderating all questions that way. You don't have to wait until the end. You can put them in there as you think of them. And toward the end, um, in those last eight minutes, Pamela will get to as many of them as we possibly can. Um, another piece is that we encourage you to tweet um, from this webinar as you see fit. The hashtag that we're encouraging you to use for live tweeting is ReproAction. All right, so briefly, who is ReproAction? ReproAction is us. We're a brand new direct action group forming to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We are just a little over a month old, and what we bring to the movement is a left flank an analysis, a willingness to hold folks on all sides of the aisle accountable, whether they are allies or opposition, so anyone who stands in the way of increasing access to abortion and advancing reproductive justice. Another thing that makes us different is that we have a commitment to nonviolent direct action. We are deeply inspired by others in our associated movements, the Black Lives Matter movement, the movement for immigration, our LGBT sisters and brothers, and we believe that the time is now for that type of action in the reproductive space. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Pamela, who's going to walk us through talking about, talking positively at a time when our movements are so deeply under attack. So Pamela? Thank you so much, Erin. Thank you. So newsflash, abortion and funding Planned Parenthood are not the same things at all. Um, so this is... Some, something that's breaking news for a lot of people. And if you've been following along on, um, on the debate that's been going on in, on Capitol Hill and in the media, particularly in the last month or two, it seems as if there's an interchangeable linking between funding Planned Parenthood's wonderful programs and abortion as if they're the same thing. So breaking news, they are not. <laughs> That doesn't mean that we should demonize abortion when defending the millions of people who count on public funding for other Planned Parenthood health care services. And obviously, everybody can't participate or isn't comfortable to participate in something like the awesome Shout Your Abortion online campaign that's currently going on. But we can all make a concerted effort to not 
demonize abortion while we're defending access and funding for Planned Parenthood health care services or any reproductive health care services. Unfortunately, that's been happening. So here are some do's. Do, um, as, as far as responding positively, do speak affirmatively about abortion access as a good thing. That abortion access um, is about maintaining the dignity of women, equality, and health care. Do place the lived experiences of low-income women, people, and women of color at the center of your conversation about Planned Parenthood and access to other forms of reproductive health care. Keep it real and make sure that people, when we're having any discussion about access to reproductive health care, that we're talking about the people who access reproductive health care. Here are some don'ts. <laughs> Don't. Do not legitimize these videos. Um, these are highly edited, and several laws may have been broken to produce these videos. The producers of the videos are linked to abortion-related terrorism. And those who reference the, these videos should be required to share what they knew about these tapes, when and what their views are on abortion-related terrorism. That's an important pushback that needs to happen anytime we're discussing these videos. Don't defend family planning by stigmatizing abortion or reinforcing abortion funding bans. This is going to be a little hard for some folks who've been, you know, that's kind of been the theme in the language that we've all been uh, raised on and reared on for so long. But if you make a concerted effort to not say abortion is only 3% of what Planned Parenthood provides and the rest is health care or nobody likes abortion or wants to fund abortion, let's work to prevent it. That's the kind of language and framing that reinforces the notion that abortion is bad and we need to stop doing that. All right, thank you, Pamela. And um, unfortunately, we've seen that a number of the strongest proponents of ending this um, harassment of Planned Parenthood have reinforced a number of those things. And so um, we hope that you all as activists can help lead the way forward. So let's move on to what's going on. And just a quick overview, I'm gonna go through a lot of material and then we're gonna digest it um, with our uh, panelists. So. Um, but I just want to give you solid footing. So first, we're going to take a look at the Sting videos and who produced them. Um, then we're going to do a quick highlight over the efforts to defund Planned Parenthood. We'll take a look at other abortion bans and restrictions that are being proposed as a response to these videos. And then we'll briefly touch on investigations, hearings, and harassment. So uh, get ready. Buckle your seatbelt. We all know it's bad. Here's some facts. So first of all, the Center for Medical Progress is the group that produced these sting videos. They've so far released several sting videos targeting Planned Parenthood, as well as um, vendors who work with them on fetal tissue do donation. And it may well be that new videos will be released in the future. To make these videos, they lied about who they were. They pretended that they were medical providers. Um, the videos are extremely and ominously edited. So as to create an impression that things were said that were not in fact said. Um, one of the most disgusting pieces, uh, there's so many disgusting things about these videos, but one of the most disgusting pieces is that it includes stolen images that were not filmed inside of a Planned Parenthood, including one of a family's stillborn baby taken and put in these videos without their consent. And I cannot imagine the heartbreak of being exploited in that way. Um, so a little bit more about the Center for Medical Progress, and specifically, we're sharing this information because we hope that you as activists, our leaders on the ground, that you will be pushing back every time someone references these videos as somehow legitimate. So their founder, David Delayden, is the former director of research for Live Action, an organization that is known for using deceptive editing to produce sting videos. Live action has long been discredited and has a longstanding grudge against Planned Parenthood and legal abortion and equality and dignity and justice for all. One thing that's really important to note is that Troy Newman, the president of Operation Rescue, sits on the board of directors of the Center for Medical Progress. Troy Newman has said 
that uh, murder of abortion providers is perhaps justifiable, or he ha is a proponent of the justifiable homicide concept. So um, what we're saying is these videos were are filled with lies. They were produced on a bed of lies. They're, um, they're linked to terrorism, and there is no reason that anyone should take these videos seriously or reference them as an important data point. Um, finally, a couple other pieces, and um, in terms of law breaking, there's a very good chance that the Center for Medical Progress will be found as having broken several laws to produce these videos. A few highlights, the US Department of Justice Justice is currently reviewing whether the footage was obtained legally. Um, the California Attorney General is also investigating the group, and the National Abortion Federation has sued to prevent the release of some videos. Those are currently in the status of a temporary injunction, and ironically, the Center for Me Medical Progress is pleading the fifth during the discovery process, um, saying that they have a right to freedom from self-incrimination. It's also interesting that they are doing that and claiming that they have that institutional right rather than a person. Um, but something that's really important to note is that again, um, these videos are built on lies, deceptions, and potential violations of law. And something that's very interesting, I attended the first hearing with one of the panelists we'll be hearing from shortly, Renee Bracey Sherman. And something that was fascinating to watch was how um, both James Bopp, uh, the attorney working for the National Right to Life Committee, um, referencing these videos, as well as many of the Republicans um, who were uh, questioning during the hearing, were, um, were very cautious about saying what they knew about these videos and when, and there was lots of reviewing with counsel over what to say. So, um, so there may be others implicated in this as well. Um, so, uh, just quick overview on the efforts to defund Planned Parenthood. Of course, these videos attempt to say that Planned Parenthood, as the opposition says, is selling baby parts, which there is absolutely none, zero, zilch evidence of that. But it's interesting that fetal tissue donation is what is it at issue in these videos, and there are no efforts to ban that. Um, rather, it's simply an excuse to try to defund Planned Parenthood and demonize abortion. And this is a long time and long term pet project of the right wing. So briefly, there are three primary strategies that the opposition is using in their efforts to defund Planned Parenthood. The first is federal bills to defund Planned Parenthood, and this is cooking on both the House and the Senate side. Another strategy that they're using is to try to attach Planned Parenthood defunding to another must-pass bill, such as um, the budget continuing resolution. And there are some folks who believe and who have signed a letter, all men, uh, that uh, if this does not go forward, they're willing to shut down the government at the price. And there's also an, a third strategy that they're using is state-level bills to defund Planned Parenthood, and that has already passed in five states. Um, and this is of dubious, at best, uh, legality because states don't have the opportunity or the ability to turn down uh, Medicaid payments on the basis of opposition to abortion. Okay, so a couple other bans and restrictions that are being tied to this. And as you know, there are a number of different, a uh, whole raft of anti-abortion uh, rights legislation that's moving through at the federal level and at the state level, but two things that uh, the people behind these videos and the people referencing these videos are trying to link them to is a 20 week abortion ban. Um, it's a direct strike at Roe v. Wade because it, um, it actually introduces an abortion, a total blanket abortion ban pre-viability. Um, and this is why it's been a pet project of the National Right to Life Committee for years. It's based on junk science. They often talk about it in terms of fetal pain, and there's no conclusive evidence that that exists. Uh, this ban passed the House a long time ago, and it failed a procedural vote in the Senate today, although it did still get a majority, and so we do have uh, problems. Another, um, another ban that they're pushing is really something that could be considered abortion provider intimidation. And they're calling this a born alive bill, but basically what it is does is it is encourages the reporting, investigation, and criminalization of abortion providers. Um, okay, so this is 
this is where it gets real messy. At the state level, there are a number of different investigations and hearings that have been opened um, with the sole purpose of harassing Planned Parenthood and demonizing abortion. They are completed in several states, and the unanimous conclusion is that um, all of these accusations leveled against Planned Parenthood are patently false. Um, interestingly, it shows uh, that there's still a political axe to grind. The Florida governor um, actually edited the findings that were presented to him of no wrongdoing in his own press release that he put out um, to make the, the investigation of Planned Parenthood's results sound more ominous than they actually were. Currently, South Carolina has forced two clinics to close for 15 days, but that's not related to the charges in the videos. And there are still a number of different pending investigations out there. Missouri um, saw state investigative hearings, and we'll be hearing very soon from Representative Stacey Newman about those. Um, both in Minnesota and in Virginia, the le legislatures asked for investigations of Planned Parenthood, and both Minnesota Governor Mark Dayton as well as Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe turned those down and rejected them as out of hand. Um, two federal hearings have already taken place, and there's another one expected next week. The bottom line and what you need to know, I'm sure there will be more investigations and hearings. Um, the right wing is rapidly trying to pursue these inquisitions. But the things that you need to take away, the two key points, are is that A, consistently Planned Parenthood has been cleared of these charges, that um, they are somehow harvesting organs, as the opposition claims, and that more attacks are likely to come, both at the federal and the state level. Um, so one piece that's also very frightening is that this has escalated into harassment and violence and even terrorism. On September 4th, there was an arson at a Planned Parenthood in Pul Pullman, Washington, and given the violent rhetoric of those pushing those videos, it's sadly not surprising and something that we'll all need to be vigilant about. Uh, the University of Missouri recently canceled their contracts with Planned Parenthood. And again, we may hear some more about that from Representative Stacey Newman soon. And then finally, another piece of the harassment that um, is ongoing is continued harassment of community uh, and contractors regarding construction of facilities in both Louisiana and also in Washington, D.C. So in sum, it's a total mess. It's based on lies, and we can expect more ahead. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Pamela and unmute uh, Representative Newman for um, her part of the panel. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, Stacy, are you there? Yes, I am. Fantastic. All right, so let's jump in. Um, Aaron, can you, oh, hold on. One second, as soon as I click to the right screen. Bear, bear with me one second. I'm having a technical error. <laughs> no problem. Pamela, do you want me to get started on the first question, and do you want to pick up after that? Would that be helpful? Sure, that would be awesome, actually. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. So, um, Representative Newman, tell us about the hearings targeting Planned Parenthood in Missouri. In particular, how was procedure not being followed, and what did you do about that? <laughs> well, thank you very much, first, uh, both um, Aaron and Pamela, for inviting me. I'm so excited to have you guys as part of our you know, uh, nationwide fight against um, all of this nonsense. But let me back up a little bit and tell you the um, investigative hearings were called by uh, a brand new committee uh, created in, the, in our state Senate um, by Senator Schaefer, who um, ran um, as a senator as a moderate uh, Republican. He's now an attorney general candidate um, in 2016, so it's taken a, a, a real big political uh, turn here. He created this summer interim committees uh, in the Senate uh, called the Sanctity of Life and took this video uh, as a way to, quote, investigate Planned Parenthood in Missouri. Uh, our Attorney General is also initiative um, an investigation. We're waiting any day for that report to come out, clearing them of, of, of any wrongdoing. But this has led, you know, Senator Schaefer to basically go on a witch hunt 
in Missouri. Um, at the same time, our second clinic um, or a clinic in Columbia, Missouri, which is the home of our largest university system, University of Missouri, uh, well beloved by everyone, um, is now under attack. They are their clinic um, has found a, a, a brand new abortion provider who has is willing to come one or two days a month, and um, you know is connected in a way to to uh, the University of Missouri in terms of they offer or have been offering you know clinical rotations, um, you know with Planned Parenthood. So Senator Schaefer now has gone after the University of Missouri, including uh, their chancellor and including threatening any of their budget for next year, which he's, you know, he's definitely on a war path. Um, this is quite dangerous, and, you know, and, you know, includes threatening the uh, university's higher ed budget. He is holding it basically hostage. Um, what he's doing now is going after, you know, uh, clinical privileges. He's asking all these questions, uh, which really um, would be uh, detrimental to the medical community here in our state. He's going after, you know, uh, tissue research, which again we have a ban on fetal tissue research in our constitution. And he's also going after how that tissue has been disposed of, which again, you know, no one has ever uh, had any question with. So in the House where I serve, um, the you know the chairs are taking kind of their their lead after Senator Schaefer calling their own investigative hearing, and we've had our so far total. There's been a total of five with nothing conclusive coming from it. We know it's a witch hunt, and they're fishing for some legislation to file next year. In the House, though, we had this past week we had the second hearing scheduled, and the chairs were. Uh, trying to limit testimony. Um, again, these are public hearings. They were trying to limit testimony to only those called by the chair. And in moments of desperation, I basically bombarded uh, the chair's offices asking for agenda, asking for those who are calling to testify, asking how long, just basically asking every detail with myself already knowing the answer. And we bombarded them for two days and, and even went to the media in terms of their cutting off public testimony. And lo and behold, they decided to cancel the hearing. So yay, one small little victory. Um, <laughs> in, so we'll take it. We'll dance around and we'll take that victory. However, we know we have got a major fight ahead of us in January when we come back into session um, because not only threatening um, doctor privileges and how they are, uh, you know, done in terms of for, for any physician, you know, with any hospital in the state. This is far reaching. We know it's an attack on Planned Parenthood. We know it's an attack on, um, you know, any type of, you know, abortion regulations. We're one of the few states that have the toughest, you know, regulations for, for anyone trying to seek an abortion for any reason. So we're gearing up for we, what we know is going to be a major, major fight. Wow. Um, thank you so much for that. It's an amazing breakdown of, of kind of what, what's been going on in Missouri. Um, and, and I've had the, the privilege and the honor of working beside you, uh, Representative Newman. So I know you're an amazing pro-choice champion in the House. Um, could you just give us a little bit more background or um, a little bit more information about the, the need to have a diverse panel of people testifying at these hearings. I know you said that um, the, one of the reasons why you were pushing back so aggressively is that they were trying to limit, limit testimony. Well, definitely, and um, I have been working, you know, for the past couple of years because we know this is this is not a new fight. It's just changed the direction um, in terms of trying to get more people to our state capitol to testify on in any of these, um, you know, re very restrictive, very repressive um, bills. Uh, yes, I mean, diversity is extremely important, Pamela, and, and it's just been such a pleasure to work with you. I'm glad you're sticking around in Missouri. Uh, but uh, along with that, in terms of trying to get, you know, more people to our capital, which is a, uh, a struggle, you know, we, that capital is located in the middle of our state. <laughs> um, it, most of us, it's a couple hour drive, which, you know, there's, an, there's another, you know, uh, hurdle for many. Um, and what I've been working on at least the last two years is trying to get more medical people there mm -hmm. to actually testify with medical facts. We don't have medical people making these, these uh, medical policy. 
uh, as state representatives. There, that's lacking. And what I'm finding by working um, a lot with Washington University, their medical school, they're completely unaware of that's how medical policy is made by people who are completely not experts. So all of this, um, all of this attention and these attacks and these witch hunt hearings are really, I think, um, what I'm seeing here, in, particularly in St. Louis, are really galvanizing um, women of all ages. I was part of a, um, a pushback protest at St. Louis Planned Parenthood on Saturday, and I was just overwhelmed by um, young people in high school, by um, college kids, men and women, and even older women um, who came out for the first time in their lives to actually, you know, to, to stand up for, um, you know, reproductive justice. And that to me is heartwarming because we know that, you know, the majority of the population, regardless, understand that we have got to protect um, abortion and reproductive access. We, we have to. And I think there's a new, it's a new wave now of, you know, young and older women and men of, you know, all backgrounds getting involved. That's fantastic. Um, so just uh, briefly, uh, knowing that other institutions with concrete or remote ties to Planned Parenthood have been and will be under similar pressures, that's the pressures that were faced by the University of Missouri, what are effective strategies moving forward and what are some of the things that, that you're planning to do um, moving forward as you prepare for next year's session? Well, that's a great question, Pamela. Um, I'm always looking for strategies. I'm always looking for help. Um, I work um, very closely with other legislators around the country who are just like me, facing, you know, these same fights in their own, you know, states um, coming from a, um, a minority uh, party. Uh, I'm always thinking in terms of what kind of pushback bills or what what message actually not just resonates with the media but resonates with people? How do we get more um, people to stand up and use their voices and use their vote on election day when many of these things are actually decided? Uh, so I'm always hunting, always searching. And in fact, I reach out to you a lot, Pamela. But I also <laughs> know that um, I, I try to encourage my colleagues also to, to become involved. As you know, many of us are working on so many different issues and being in the um, minority, we're stretched kind of thin. Uh, and, you know, many people are still sort of afraid of this issue, afraid to be um, outspoken. Um, so I'm always looking at, you know, my little tiny victory of getting the, the chair to, to you know, um, cancel the hearing. Is there other ways that I can keep after that process calling things out, letting people know exactly day to day uh, what's happening um, and uh, I'm, I'm just I'm overjoyed though by the response uh, mm -hmm. just in the past couple of days um, a, uh, a widow of the first abortion doctor in St. Louis I mean he passed away last year at age 85 his widow has reached out to me and says and has told me that she had not been involved in this fight for you know 30 40 years and she's ready to come back so wow. people who have been through this, who have the stories, that know that, you know, um, women are going to seek abortions um, like they have had since the beginning of time. We know that we need to protect those lives because, you know, women die. And yet this is something that we must have and it must be legal and it must be safe. And I know that um, any strategies anyone has out there, please let me know because I'm always looking for, you know, more ways to, to either cause trouble or speak out. Well, thank you so much. And, and it feels like you're, you're such a champion and such a, a blessing to have advocating for women in the state of Missouri. So Representative Stacey Newman, thank you so much. And thank you both. Thank you both. All awesome. right, Erin. Yeah, thank you, Stacey. I'm going to put you on mute. And um, again, if you have any questions for Stacey, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Now I'm going to unmute Emily Crockett, our next panelist. Hello, Emily. Hello, Erin. Thanks for having me. Hello. Thanks so much for joining us. So Emily has to have one of uh, the most crazy-making jobs in the country right now. She is the federal policy reporter for RH Reality Check, and she's been 
um, tracking and reporting on everything that's been happening. So Emily, we don't envy you, but we're so glad that you're here to help us break this all down. Um, oh God, shoot me. Yes, thank you. <laughs> So my first question is, you know, I think um, it, for, for those of us who live and breathe this every day, it can even be hard to keep it straight. And then, um, and then I just know that many activists out there are like, oh my gosh, there's so many different efforts to defund Planned Parenthood. I don't understand what's going on. So my first question to you is just simply, which efforts to defund Planned Parenthood do you think, based on your reporting and knowledge, that we should be most concerned about, and why do you think that? So this is an interesting question, because to some extent, we should be concerned about none of them, at least not right now, because none of them are going to become law. Or, well, no, I should say at the federal level. At the state level, we should absolutely be concerned, um, because there is, there, there, there's more appetite, there's more leverage that these governors have. Um, to at least cut funding. They may not be able to completely eliminate funding because um, there's this interesting thing with Medicaid, right, where um, federal law does not allow you to discriminate against the, provi the Medicaid provider of a patient's choice uh, for reasons that are not something that disqualifies them as a health care provider. So, for instance, if you don't like that Planned Parenthood provides abortions, that's not enough reason to kick them off of Medicaid. And uh, states like Louisiana um, and Arkansas are in, um, uh, are in some legal trouble over this, and there are some fights over that at the state level. Now, at the federal level, it's sort of a, it's sort of a weird thing, and it's not entirely clear whether the whether these new laws at the federal level can actually do anything about Medicaid funding or not, because what people don't realize all, all the time about Planned Parenthood is that about three quarters of its government funding at both the state and the federal, so we're talking half a billion dollars for both state and federal funding, about three quarters of that is Medicaid. And that's mandatory spending, and you can't really just kind of nix it in appropriations. However, um, so let me just lay out a couple of the different strategies and bills that we're seeing. Um, so there's a bill by Diane Black that just passed the House and that I believe is uh, has been fast-tracked and uh, will get a vote, well, may get a vote soon in the Senate. Now this is a standalone bill again and it will defund Planned Parenthood for one year. It's uh, touted as sort of a temporary moratorium on funding and the idea is that it gives Congress time to complete their very serious investigations, and I'll get to why those are not at all serious in a minute. Um, but uh, so this bill, you know, again, it's a one-year defunding. It passed the House with flying colors because the House is full of anti-choice legislators. Um, it is not, it, it won't pass the Senate, it just won't, um, if it even gets a vote at all, which it, it may well. Now, so that's a standalone bill. You may have heard about a government shutdown, uh, that Planned Parenthood may shut down the government. This will happen if and only if uh, plan, um, the Senate and the House pass federal spending bills that fund the government, and the deadline for this is September 30th. If, we're, if we don't have a funding bill by October 1st, the government shuts down. So if the Senate and the House pass bills um, that, that fund the government, which is going to be most likely a continuing resolution. Continuing resolutions are just keeping on the current funding levels and are very frustrating because they don't really let you deal with new programs. But anyway, it's a temporary stopgap, annoying, kick the can down the road measure. But nonetheless, it is pretty much what we've got if we're going to fund the government. Um, so, and this just happened today that Mitch McConnell, Senate Majority Leader, who has for weeks and weeks and months been saying that he thinks that trying to shut down the government over Planned Parenthood is a losing strategy, that, you know, that it's, it, it hasn't worked before, it's not going to work now, because President Obama will veto anything defunding Planned Parenthood. It probably won't even get past the Senate because there are enough Democrats to filibuster. And people will blame Republicans for the shutdown like they did in 2013 um, when the government was shut down over Obamacare. Now, if the website thing hadn't been such a disaster, it might have been different. But anyway, um, so so we have so we have a new bill from a new spending bill that just got filed today uh, by McConnell. And McConnell, who's been saying all this time, no, 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 bad idea, bad idea. 
suddenly he's turning around and going, okay, fine, um, and has filed this bill that, that it's a spending bill that a spending bill, a continuing resolution that will defund Planned Parenthood. Um, and it, this it, normally these kind of things starts in, start in the House. Right now it is starting in the Senate because the House cannot get its act together. John Boehner is fighting tooth and nail against the House Freedom Caucus, which are the far right wing Tea Partiers. There are several dozen of those guys who have signed letters vowing not to support any spending bill that funds Planned Parenthood. Um, so, uh, so this this shutdown strategy is really the thing to be most worried about, I suppose, in answer to your question, um, because it is n not not because it's going to pass, but because it is going to be a big headache and it will mess with people's lives if the government actually shuts down. The silver lining may be that people wake up to how ridiculous the Republicans are being, um, but that's that's something to be um, concerned about. Um, now, the other effort to defund Planned Parenthood that people don't really know about and that I want to draw your attention to, and this may not ever see the light of day, but there, there were a couple of new bills in the House Energy and Commerce Committee that had a hearing recently. These are two bills, one by Marsha Blackburn and one by Renee Elmers. They are trying to get around the Medicaid rule by allowing states to kick a provider off of Medicaid if they merely suspect that the provider has violated either the Born Alive Infants Protection Act or the Partial Birth Abortion Act. Now what do either of these things have to do with Planned Parenthood, you may be asking, and you would be correct to ask that. Republicans, lately, have been very fond of trying to connect Planned Parenthood to both later abortions, Kermit Gosnell, and infanticide. And they are trying to conflate safe and legal later abortions with infanticide because that's just how their brains work and that's uh, what, they're, what they're trying to do. And so, that, so then you have these insane hearings like the House Judiciary Committee where we had um, two of the four witnesses were so-called abortion survivors, women who said that in the 70s they survived and attempted abortion. And in the House Energy and Commerce, so in, 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 in all, in both the House Judiciary and the House Energy and Commerce investigations, remember I talked about the not serious, very silly investigations. You can read more about those. I did, I did pretty detailed write-ups of both of those. Um, they're just, you know, they're, they're obviously they're witch hunts, they're show trials, they're just charades. Um, but both of them featured, wit featured only one pro-choice witness each, and they each tried to conflate, tried to sort of convince people that Planned Parenthood is either violating the Partial Birth Abortion a Ban Act or, or is um, giving birth to live viable infants only to kill them for their parts and for profit. This is complete madness, but this is what they want people to believe. And this is what all of their hearings, all of their floor speeches, this is what this is all aimed towards. And it comes from just kind of a footnote, honestly, in the Center for Medical Progress videos. Most of the talk is about fetal tissue and, you know, selling baby parts. But sort of buried underneath it are these sort of weird quotes about intact fetuses. And they keep bringing these over and over and over again. Now, these quotes are most likely edited. They're most likely not even accurate. However, um, CMP believes, falsely I might add, that just because a fetus, that if a fetus come, is, is intact as a specimen, then that means it's very likely that either partial birth abortion was used or that it was live when it was born. Yeah. So, oh. Yeah. Yeah, no, go ahead. It's just, I think that's one of um, the, the most important themes for people to take away from it is that these hearings, which you've noted, are not serious at all. Um, are one of the things that they're trying to do is really demonize abortion. And also another theme that um, thing that they're trying to do, whether it's the repeated ominous use of the word intact in the videos or trying to link um, family planning funding at Planned Parenthood with what they call partial birth abortion. There is no such procedure or infants being born alive and then killed, which again, there is no such thing that is happening and there's no factual evidence for that. If there's also an effort to edit women and people who have abortions out of the equation entirely. And so it's really important that there are some long-term objectives being hit beyond um, specific policy measures. And 
I think with that, Emily, this has been amazing. And I would encourage everyone to chat in questions into the chat box for Emily for Q&A at the end. Um, and also to be sure to read her work at RH Reality Tech, because she is uh, clearly knows her stuff and can help us break this down and understand what's happening. So thank you so much, Emily. I wish we had more time. Oh, yes. Thanks, Sarah. This has been awesome. Okay. And with that, I am going to mute Emily, uh, pass it back to uh, Pamela, and unmute Renee Bracey Sherman. Thank you so much, Erin. Renee Bracey Sherman, um, are you on the line? I'm here. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Thanks for having me. Um, so, Renee, the voices of people who've had abortions have been explicitly excluded from these debates. For example, in the federal investigation hearings, we've had no witnesses who are speaking about their abortions and how the vast majority of people who have them do not report regret. What perspective is being lost when that happens? Well, you know, I think it's the actual reality of what it's like to have an abortion. Um, it really saddens me that, you know, when people are debating or, or reality arguing about abortion, um, we leave out the voices of people who've actually had them, the real reasons as to why we might actually need them. Um, mm -hmm. We get left to kind of, you know, put down into these stereotypes and myths and, and sometimes statistics, and we're actually real people with real stories. Um, and I think that this happens for a couple of reasons. Um, one, Congress doesn't respect people like me. Um, they don't, we are often people of color, they don't respect us. Uh, we're women, we are trans men, we are middle and low income um, folks. Um, they simply don't respect us and they don't care to hear our voice mm -hmm. and we need to change that um, they don't want to hear our stories because they think that they know that people will be moved once they hear us um, if we know that when you hear the actual life experience of someone who has a stigmatized um, story you know be it a long mental illness or um, sexuality or gender identity you start to kind of understand and realize that that person's experience challenges what you've always been told within society. Mm -hmm. And so they know that if they were to put one of us on the panel, um, we might actually reach people. We might actually change some hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. um, I think the third thing is that um, when we share our abortion stories, we challenge um, what all of us are kind of socialized in society about womanhood and motherhood. Um, our stories give people space to really think, rethink what society says about gender, our destiny, how we create families, if we want to create families, um, and what those families can look like, and how you know, no matter what the families look like, um, they're all they're ours, and um, it's our right to be able to create them in the ways that make us happiest and best for our situation. And conservatives definitely do not want us talking about that on TV. <laughs> too true, too true. Um, so last week, Representative Trent Franks spoke to, on one of the bills on the House floor with an opening statement that we are all created equal, and then in the course of five minutes, never mentioned women or people who have abortions. That mm -hmm. leaves a dis I know, it leaves a distinct impression that part of the long-term strategy of these videos and these legislative efforts is to erase women and pregnant people and leave their humanity and dignity out of the, of the abortion debate. Uh, how can we resist this? So as Erin mentioned earlier, I, we were sitting together at that hearing and um, she can attest to this. I was like ready to jump out of my seat. I was <laughs> losing my mind because I was just so angry with not just what um, Representative Frank said, but all of them were saying they weren't kind of, they were ignoring what our real lived experiences are as to why um, we need abortions. Um, when we erase the stories of those who have an abortion from the narrative, um, it's easy to ignore kind of the nuanced reasons. Um, it's easy to paint us with an inaccurate brush um, and to kind of 
not talk about the other issues like racism, sexism, economic justice issues that are keeping us um, from accessing our you know, highest potential and we're not able to access birth control and other family planning, health care, they'd have to actually face it. Um, and they don't want to. They don't want to have to kind of look at how their policies are failed. Um, and it just keeps us silent. Um, I think one of the things that I do, um, aside from I really wanted to just like jump up and shout at him, but I didn't um, because mm -hmm. I was like, okay, not appropriate. Um, but one <laughs> of the things that I do is I constantly talk about my abortion. I talk about it with cab drivers. Um, I actually just got back from Mexico City on Sunday, and I, the Border Patrol agent asked me, what do I do? And I said, well, I fund abortions. <laughs> um, I talk about it everywhere to normalize it. Um, we have to really point out that the narratives that we're being told about people who have abortions are untrue. Um, we have to point out how they're based in stigma, how they're based in sexism, how a lot of them are based in classism and racism. We mm -hmm. really, really need to point that out. Um, and it, it takes all of us to point that out. It's more than just putting, you know, I'm a pro-choice voter sticker on your car. It's having those deep conversations with folks in your lives. Got it. And so you do share your abortion story publicly, as you just said. And some advocates have argued that people who have abortion should be responsible for coming out, if you are, and sharing their stories. And as we've seen this week, there's um, the awesome online campaign, Shout Your Abortion. Um, you take a different view that you're saying that, that a different view from, from folks who are saying that you have to come out. Could you just tell us more about that? about your opinion on it. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's funny, I was preparing for the webinar and I was realizing that today is the four year anniversary of sharing my abortion story publicly. Wow. Um, wow. Yes, <laughs> four years. Um, I had my abortion, it was 10 years ago last month. Um, and I've never looked back. And I think that sharing it publicly has been an amazing, wonderful, also scary and frustrating experience. Um, and for me, it was a way to fight back against the stigma um, and stand up to the people who were bullying me, whether they knew it or not. And I remember in ethics class in undergrad, I actually skipped the day we talked about abortion because I, I didn't know what people were going to say about me. And it's hard to sit at a table and hear people say things about you that are not based in fact that are, you know, based in stereotypes and, but not feel safe enough to kind of call it out. Um, so, you know, I'm all for sharing stories. I think um, it's empowered me and it's changed my life and I, I would do it again. Um, but I think we also need to recognize that not everyone is able to do it or that they even want to. Um, I know a lot of folks who have shared their story with me privately and are like, I just, I don't want to do what you do. I can't do it. And that's okay. We need to, you know, tell them that they are valued and they are loved too. It doesn't, just because they're not writing about it in the New York Times doesn't mean that they are any less valued. Um, and research shows that actually people do share their abortion stories with, you know, about one or two people in their lives. It doesn't have to be super public. Um, that's sharing them with the, uh, your loved ones is valued as well. Um, and I think that sharing your abortion story involves a lot of privilege. Um, you have to know that if you're going to share, it won't jeopardize your job prospects or your relationships with family and friends, your financial stability. Hopefully you'll have somewhere to live that, you know, your family members will still house you. Um, and I believe in trusting that folks who have had abortions, um, they get to decide what's best for them, both if, when, and how they want to become a parent, and if, when, and how they actually want to share their abortion stories. I don't think that it's um, fair to kind of force people to share when they're deciding that it's maybe not the right time. Um, I think lastly, I think that we can't always assume that sharing stories is going to like 
fix the world. Um, there's a lot of things that we need to do to end stigma and to put all of that weight on the shoulders of people who share their abortion stories. It's a lot. We get harassed a lot. Um, I've gotten death threats and nasty, nasty stuff. Um, and so I understand if somebody doesn't want to take that on. What I do think needs to happen is that people who haven't had abortions, they need to kind of stand up and show that they are there for us and that they are a support system. They need to help us make sure that the climate is a safer space so that when someone does want to share their story, they feel like they can. And I think doing that um, is like talking, like I said, talking to your family and friends about that you stand up with with people who've had abortions. Um, I think my last point is that last night I was at a bar with a cousin of mine and um, this guy came up to us and was making a transphobic joke and he looked at me and I was like, trans women are women. That's not acceptable in front of me. Calling that out every single day is important. It's not on, say, trans women to have to constantly out themselves to talk about these issues and reduce the stigma. It's on those of us who have privilege to call it out when and where we can. And so that's how we all work together to make sure that spaces are safe for everyone. Wow. Thank you so much, Renee. I'm all fired up now. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for your perspective and for joining our webinar. Thanks. Erin. All right, so that's a, that's a wonderful seg. It's been powerful, all three of our panelists. Um, but as Renee noted, this is on all of us to carry this weight together. And activism can be many things, and it can be as simple as saying that joke isn't funny anymore. On this particular um, issue, I want to be clear, first of all, that you know there are a number of local efforts that you may be able to tack onto with regards to these heinous bills and um, as well as the abortion stigma that's flying around in response to these videos. And we encourage you to take any and all of them. Here at ReproAction, however, I want to note that in addition to that, we are deeply committed to taking a big picture attack on this. And we want to see the whole movement shift from this defensive, reactive posture that we've been forced into and start going on the offense. And so one of the things that we want to do is encourage um, grassroots organizing at the local level. And our ask for you today is uh, that we're seeking local leaders who want to gather a small group and host a conversation on moving from defense to offense in your community. Um, we know this is a great first step toward grassroots organizing that fights and wins. And so um, whether you're interested in organizing actual um, direct actions, or you just want to get people talking, that can be very valuable to you. Um, it doesn't have to be fancy or huge. We're suggesting that you just have a conversation of a small group of people that can sit together and talk. Um, we're not asking you to organize a panel or do something fancy like that. And we have a support and conversation kit that we'll provide to you. So if you want in, um, just reply yes to the email that we'll send you and follow up after this. Um, and I hope to talk to some of you. I know that we've got some pending already and, um, it's just, it's really exciting and fantastic. Um, another thing that I want to encourage everyone to do, if you haven't already done it, to sign up for alerts at reproaction.org. Um, at this point in time, we're a brand new organization. Our campaigns have been online. We will be moving into a on the ground, uh, boots on the ground, uh, direct action type work as we continue moving forward. So if you're interested in both online or the um, physical activism or both, um, we'd be glad to have you. Um, our current campaigns up now are Bad Legacy, and that is targeting President Obama uh, regarding his failure to take executive action on the Helms Amendment. Um, something he could do, and there's no excuse. And we also have a very timely campaign, Hey Pope Francis. Um, as you know, Pope Francis landed, uh, was due to scheduled to land this afternoon in the United States. And um, so we're encouraging you to tell him what you think. Um, we've got a, a campaign up there at reproaction.org. And also connect to us on social media. Um, so with that, one other thing just quickly, and then we'll have about five minutes for questions. 
Um, we Please save the date for the next Repro Action Act and Learn webinar. The topic is to be announced, but it is just, it's going to be just like this in the sense that it's geared toward um, bringing together activists and doers and thought leaders to share strategies, increase our knowledge, um, say what's working in our communities, and really increase the effectiveness of, of the entire movement. Um, so we hope you'll join us on Tuesday, October 27th from 7 to 8 Eastern time. And it looks like we've got a few minutes left for questions. So I'll pass it back to Pamela uh, to moderate that. And then I'm also going to unmute all of our um, panelists that we've had um, so that just know that you won't be on mute anymore. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Erin. So we do have a couple of questions. The first one is from Steph. And it's, do we know whether University of Missouri will provide any clinical rotation placements in family planning post-termination of PP contracts? So after terminating those contracts. Um, Representative Newman, do you, uh, do you know the status of well, I know that this is a, a, a new question, and, and um, I know that there's a lot of uh, pressure put, being put on the chancellor right now to uh, discontinue that idea, you know, to allow, you know, uh, Planned Parenthood to be part of the clinicals. Um, this is, since this is so new, no one seems to know what's going to happen next, but I encourage everyone to, you know, reach out to the chancellor and let them know that this is a, a wrong move. Good move, good move. Um, great question. Um, the next question we have is from Misty, and Misty says, I'm a pro-choice activist on a very conservative campus where the campus Republicans have been spreading inaccurate information about Planned Parenthood and abortion via sidewalk chalk and student, the student newspaper and handouts in the quad. How can my student organization spread accurate information keeping in mind the highly conservative campus climate? That is a fantastic question, Misty. So I'm going to selfishly um, say that we would love for you to reach out to us at ReproAction. Um, you can email me directly at Pamela at ReproAction.org, and we can talk through some ways um, to help you do some grassroots organizing on your campus. But I'm going to open it up to the panelists to see if there's any other suggestions. I went to a ridiculously liberal campus, so um, I don't have a lot of experience of navigating conservative campus climates, but maybe some folks on the uh, um, of the panel do. Hey, it's Renee. Um, you know, there's some great organizations that do um, local organizing both on campus and in communities that you can connect with. Um, I work at the National Network of Abortion Funds, and so you can kind of get involved through your local abortion fund there. And um, there's always some kind of great events that you can just put together where you can talk about, you know, the actual need, um, why people have abortions, what the realities are. Um, Guttmacher has some great statistics. And then also um, Advocates for Youth is an amazing organization. Um, they often do speak outs on campuses and um, you can organize an abortion speak out. I think one of those things is it can be a little challenging for folks who may or may not want to um, share their abortion stories, but for those who are ready to, um, it can be a powerful experience and it lets all of those campus uh, Republican activists actually hear why somebody um, might need an abortion. I know from personal experience that I've had some people change their opinion after hearing mine, so that's always an option. Great advice. Thank you so much. And Any just other advice? Really quickly. Sorry, yep. um, in terms of organizing, I think we always forget that we're all sitting on our own networks in terms of our own Facebook friends and our own, you know, uh, Twitter reach. And I encourage women, you know, don't don't wait for someone else to contact you. You know, talk to your friends. You know, use your Facebook politically. Let them know what's what's happening and what's at stake. And you know, I think you'll discover that you have a your own little organization. You know, just right under your fingertips. Great advice. Um, thank you so much for that. So we're actually coming up at 7, and we're trying to be prompt with our webinars and end um, when we say we're going to. So I'm just going to encourage again um, everybody on the call, if you are interested in doing um, grassroots organizing in your community, we are looking for local leaders. You can reach out to Erin 
at, or myself, Erin, is Erin at ReproAction.org. I'm Pamela at ReproAction.org. We sincerely hope that you do reach out to us and we can get you started with a conversation kit and then also help you with some strategies of how to deal with the unique climate that you're working with or organizing in. We'd like to thank our panelists, Renee, Representative Newman, and Emily for giving us some fantastic panel. And thank you to everybody who was able to attend. We have recorded this, and we will make it available on our website, reproaction.org, in the next uh, couple of days. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.